I have a word that I want to just share with you beforehand. David, the King David, was praying about the word, when the, the laws of God, extolling the words of God in Psalm 19. And then at the end of it, he says, and I want you to pray this with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. And just in case you're wondering what we're going to be talking about today, we're going to be asking this question, why does God allow suffering? Now, I find this quite ironic that Alan has asked me to do this because at the sight of a needle, I break out into an enormous sweat. I don't know about you. I think Alan is trying to get at me. So just point towards him and say, Lord, forgive him. <laughs> yeah, there's more. All right, let's look at this passage of Scripture. Consider it sheer gift, friends, when testing or tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. I think we can stop the sermon right there, can't you? That's enough for one day. Ellen said that's good. So I'm praying that today you will have many, 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 many questions after the sermon, many that will, that will not be answered during the course of the sermon, because many mysteries or this mystery of suffering has been something that has challenged theologians, challenged philosophers throughout the ages and people more learned than myself. And so I'm not going to be able to put a full stop to any of the questions or any of the debate about, around the subject of suffering. It's only a short little sermon and we've been given a short period of time. So Alan has said, kiss. Keep it short, stupid. I mean, silly. I mean, sermon. <laughs> Suffering is something that we really don't like. But why does God, a good God, allow something as horrible as suffering to exist in our world? To disturb, to disrupt, and to destroy what is otherwise a peaceful existence. Generally, suffering is something that we neither desire nor is it useful in our own opinions. We can never understand it at the time, just as what, what Manny was saying earlier. So what constitutes suffering? It's something, in my opinion, I always thought this, it's just something that other people did to me and made me endure. And so what happens is I build up resentment and anger and take offense at the person or the origin of the suffering that is coming my way. But the dictionary says this, suffering is the kind of pain you feel when you shatter your ankle. I don't know if you've experienced that. Any bone. It's also what happens when you're in the middle of a tornado or an earthquake. And we've seen those just recently. Not in our country, but north of us. It's what you, suffering is something that doesn't make you happy. In fact, while you're undergoing suffering, you're quite miserable. And you let everybody else know that you're miserable. I mean, suffering. Now, the Latin root word for suffering, is it, it paints a picture that is uh, a very vivid picture. The words around suffering, very vivid picture of what suffering is. But the root word means to suffer, to be below, to be pressed down, to have to bear something. That's the root word of the word suffering. Now, there are other words that you can use. It's, but I just mean it's, it's opposite of fun. It's not something you go and do and say, guys, let's go out for a bit of suffering. 
There are other words like hurt or distress or agony or excruciating or pain. Now, what's going on in Ukraine, when you look at the war between Russia and Ukraine, we can, we can absolutely say with certainty that war is one of the chief causes of suffering in our world. It's man's inhumanity to man. That's one of the causes of suffering. Another reason why suffering is so prevalent in our world is man's rejection of God's final and ultimate authority. And so this blatant disregard for God's holiness allows sin to reign in our world. Sin is never God's intention, nor is suffering, but it is the result of James writes this, James the brother of Jesus. He says this, remember, when someone wants to do wrong, it is never God who is tempting him. For God never wants to do wrong and never tempts anyone else to do it. Temptation is the pull of man's own desire or evil thoughts and wishes. These evil thoughts and evil actions and afterwards to the death penalty from sin. It leads to the evil actions and afterwards the death penalty of sin from God. Just look at the way that God dealt with his, his people, the chosen people, the Israelis. They are the chosen people of God. They are in a very special, ultimate relationship with him, the apple of his eye. The intention was that through these people, the whole world would come to know who God really is. And so they were called out to live a relationship of obedience, marked by obedience. This is what God wants. This is the covenant. This is what I'm requiring of you. And we know that, oh, we read through the scriptures, they decided to do exactly the opposite to what God wants. And as a result of that, they experienced famine, sickness, uh, they experienced exile, they experienced alienation, even death. And one of the things that we find in the scriptures, is, and it sounds so hard when you read it in the Old Testament, when they did something wrong, the punishment was so severe. And we, we, we absolutely don't like it. But when we read the New Testament, the wages of sin is death. And that's eternal if you stay in that place. God hasn't changed. It's not an Old Testament God and a New Testament God. It's the same God. So consider it sheer, a sheer gift. I don't know about you. I don't think that that's a sheer gift in my life. I do not consider it pure joy. I, I don't go around saying, hallelujah, I'm suffering. It's lacquer. Suffering is something never sought or desired. Some people are losing their jobs because they follow Jesus. Have you thought about that? I want to tell you a little story. This is a story of a man who was working as a, as a packer in a, in a a retail store, and he had a, a tattoo, a Christian tattoo on his arm. And as he was working with his friend, he stretched out his arm to pick up some merchandise to put it on the shelf. And the friend said, oh, are you a Christian? Pointing at the tattoo. And the man said, yes. So he said, ah, oh, so you hate all people who are LGBTQ, I and all those things. He said, no, 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 I don't. No, no, that's what all Christians do. You all hate us. A week later, this man with a tattoo was called into the the boss's office and said, I'm sorry, but we have to let you go because you do not fit into our culture any longer. Just a tattoo. But there's no escape clauses in some of the things that Jesus says. It is some of the things that Jesus said are so offensive to our ears. Look at this. Don't think I've come to make life cozy. 
Hallelujah. Accept Jesus into your life and everything will be rosy in the garden. No problems, no suffering. It'll all be great. But this is what Jesus said. I've come to cut, make a sharp knife cut between son and father, between daughter and mother, between bride and mother-in-law. Cut through these cozy domestic arrangements and free you for God. Notice that. Free you for God. Suffering has a purpose. Well-meaning family members can be your worst enemies. If you prefer father or mother over me, you don't deserve me. If you prefer son or daughter over me, you don't deserve me. If you don't go all the way with me through thick and thin, you don't deserve me. If your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. But if you forget about yourself and look to me, you will find both yourself and me. Those are words of Jesus. And there's no escape clause. He can't say, well, you know, this only applies to pastors. Or this only applies to that group of people. It applies to anybody who wants to follow Jesus. So what's the purpose of suffering? Why does God, who is supposed to be so good and powerful, allow suffering to exist in our beautiful world? So let's examine some of the questions that cause us to, or let's look at some of the reasons that cause us to examine. I've got it wrong. I can't see it on this page yet. I believe that this question should cause us to examine the, the origin of suffering. Mainly because if God is the creator of the universe, then suffering must have its origin in the very act of creation. Suffering, suffering did not create itself. It didn't come into being of its own volition. It has to have an origin. And if God created everything that is, did God create suffering? So when we are confronted by pain or suffering, something about it, it demands your full attention. You know, the, the, the Zulu people have a wonderful phrase. And it has context in which it is said. If you hurt your toe, the whole body has to bend over to sort out that toe. What happens is that the whole body is consumed by that sore toe. If you know what it's like when you, the whole idea why Lego was created so that you can walk in the dark and find where the light is. So much so that we find it difficult to even believe that God is present sometimes when we're confronted by pain and suffering. Where is God? That question, if God is so good, why does he not stop war? Why does he not? That's the question. And the, and the, the behind that question is the understanding God's not present or he's not powerful. He appears to be sometimes distant or aloof to the point that we doubt his goodness or even his existence. Currently, the Canadian state of Alabama, not Alabama, what's it called? Alberta. <sighs> They're calling it Alberia now, not Alberta. It's so cold. Okay, just a thought, okay. The state of Alberta is currently experiencing runaway fires. Now, Helen's sister Sue stays in Alberta and this is a photograph that was taken of the midday sun through the smoke that was caused by the, well, well, yeah, the fire. That's, you're looking directly at the sun. Can you see the sun? No. It seems to be so far away. And it's possible because of the experience of pain and suffering to view God's involvement in exactly the same way. We think of God like that. He's there, but he's not very effective. He's present, but he's not very powerful. And 
And so the origin of suffering. The Bible begins with the story of creation, Genesis 1 and 2. And here we see that God, who is altogether all-powerful, altogether all-good, it's He who is the uncreated creator of everything. He is good. You know, and one thing, He, says, he speaks so powerfully the entire ex- the universe into being. And one of the things He said, everything He made was good. He looked at it every single day. At the end of the day, He sat back and He said, that's good. That's good. And when He created man, He said, that's very good. Just look at the person next to you and say, you're very good. You're very good. Yeah. And if you, it's your husband saying that to you, say. All right. So the first words to mankind is one of blessing. Husbands, wives, the first word you say to one another when you get out of bed or wake up in the morning, you're good, you're very good. And then you bless her. Right? You speak generously to her. And then everything goes well with the rest of the day. Happy wife, uh, sorry. <laughs> so from the beginning of the Bible, it is clear that God is all powerful and he is altogether good. Everything God was making was good. There was no suffering involved. He didn't look at suffering and say, that's good. That's very good. In fact, I think what I'll, bore, what I'm about, I'll create some more cancer. It's good to give people cancer. It's good to make people have broken bones. Oh, it's so lacquer. I feel so good about it. Can you hear God saying that? Then man fell into Satan's bait. And the first thing that Satan says to us, did God really say that you're a child of God? Did he really say that you're good? Did he really say that he loves you? I mean, really, I mean, look at you. You're such a... And the moment he got man to doubt God's goodness, love and provision, that was, became a gateway through which sin and suffering entered into the world. Every time you as a parent, you've said to your child, this is the way I want you to do it, and he has done, or she has done the very opposite. What is your reaction? It's not to say, well done, thou good and faithful child, but you say to them, come here, let me warm up your ears. <laughs> well, some of us did that anyway. I mean, that's how I grew up. Huh? I don't know about you. Okay. But with some... Well, when that happens, sin and suffering enters into our world. It's often the reason, or the reason for this, is misplaced affection. When I desire something that is not from God, or of God, or for God. When I go after something that is not so good in my life. This is one of the words from John the disciple whom Jesus loved. He said, don't set the affections of your heart on this world. Oops. I must get a new car. Jesus tells the wonderful story of the man who wants to break down this barn, build another barn because he's got so much and he wants to sit back and be merry and drink. And, and Jesus said to him, you fool, tonight your, your soul is required of you. We're never satisfied with what we've got. We're always wanting something else and going after it with the affections of our heart. In this world, or do not set your affections or your heart on this world, or in loving the things of this world. The love of the Father and the love of the world are incompatible. For all that the world can offer us, the gratification of our, of our flesh, the allurement of the things of the world, and the obsession with status and importance. Sound familiar? None of these things come from the Father, but from the world. This world and its desires are in the process of passing away. But those who love and do the will of the Father live forever. I can just imagine Africa Mkhlopi saying something like this. Live forever. But you want to have one foot in this world and one foot in that world, and you wonder why we're not really growing 
Or I can just imagine him saying something. But the good news of the gospel is that the devil doesn't get the last word. Hallelujah. Amen. So if you're experiencing suffering, it's not the last word. If you're experiencing pain, this too, somebody said to me, will pass. Then this is the good news. This when I look at Jesus. Then Jesus arrived from Nazareth, anointed by God with the Holy Spirit, ready for action. Huh. He went through the country helping people and healing everyone who was beaten down by the devil. He was able to do all this because God was with him. And Jesus was a man acquainted with sorrow and pain. And never once did he say, I don't believe God exists. Jesus is God's last word on this issue of sin, sickness, suffering, and death. He destroyed the kingdom of the evil one. And you all look so happy. Joyful beyond measure. And then we read, going on, carrying on with the Bible, we begin with a glimpse at the end of creation. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of a God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Hallelujah. We're all looking forward to heaven, right? You want to get there today, don't you? You've got to die first. <laughs> God is still, we read at the end of the Bible, God is still the all-powerful, God the all-good, and there's no suffering. There's no suffering in heaven. It's never God's intention. In the in-between time, Jesus says this, between the creation, crucifixion, resurrection, and the day when we're going to be before God, in the meantime, Jesus says, I've told you all this so that trusting me, you will be unshakable and assured, deeply at peace. In this godless world, you will continue to experience difficulties. But take heart, I've conquered the world. Do not be surprised, says Peter, when you face various trials. Don't be surprised. Jesus promised it. And so we, as we encounter pain and suffering of any sort, how do we learn to endure? How do we learn to carry on and not give up? How do we learn to come through the experience victorious, triumphant? Now one of the things I've got, so Winston Churchill, he said in, during the war, he said, if you feel like you're going through hell, don't stop. Go through. The writer of the letter to Hebrews reminds us, he says, keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it. Because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way. Cross, shame, whatever. And now he is there in the place of honor right alongside God. When we find ourselves flagging in our faith, go over that story again, item by item, that long litany of hostility he plowed through, that will shoot adrenaline, adrenaline into your souls. Suffering is not the end. It's not even an end. Our experience of suffering or pain is not the end. Um, this life is not the end of life. And because of whom and what Jesus has done, through his cross and resurrection, we have a wonderful future to which we can look forward. Suffering is not the end. I want to say it again and again. It's not an end. 
It's not even an end. We can do this with complete assurance because he has given us his Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit has come to live within us. And one of the things he does is he convicts us of what Jesus has done. He con- con- no, that's the right word. He makes real to us. He affirms it through inner conviction in our life. And it was this inner conviction, this reality of knowing that this life is not the end, that enabled the saints of old to carry on through some of the worst persecution we've ever known. More people have died in this generation for Jesus than in any of the other previous um, centuries. People are doing it because they said, Jesus, we trust you. Suffering and pain will be with us until we meet with Jesus face to face. And so as I look at Helen and others who are stricken with life-threatening diseases, I realize that as Christians, we're not exempt from physical suffering or physical pain or sickness. So Paul brings these understandings together when he writes to the Corinthians and he says, Therefore, we do not lose heart. When you're facing suffering, when you're facing persecution, don't lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Hallelujah. So you are younger today than you were yesterday, right? You are more renewed today than you were yesterday. Okay, let's try that again. You are more renewed and in love with Jesus today than you were yesterday. Amen. Amen. Yeah. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. The suffering that you're in, it far outweighs that suffering. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. Pain and suffering is temporary. It will come to an end. But what is unseen is eternal. So we need to be finding meaning in suffering. Our God is able to to redeem suffering. I love this. This is one of the things I really enjoyed doing while I was preparing. Even the experience of suffering. But this requires that we are able to see much further than the ends of our noses. When suffering and mocking, mockingly says to you, ha, 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 I've got you, this is the end of your life. We need to be able to say to them, Satan, you do not get to say the last word in my life. Only God does. With God, our God, pain and suffering is merely the beginning of an adventure in obedience. Faith in God is an act of obedience where I say what God has said, I choose to believe God, not my circumstances. Our God is a God who alters the facts. Just ask anybody who's been healed. The facts are, I have got this problem. When I met with Jesus, he has changed the facts. I'm no longer suffering from that problem. He changes the facts. So our faith is in a God who alters the facts with his truth. And I need to believe his truth rather than the lie. It's an act of obedience. I need to take God's word and say, this is what you're saying. I'm going to choose to believe you. And even though I don't see an immediate answer, I'm choosing to believe you. You ask Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they say, even if you kill us, we will not bow down. We will not give in. We believe that this God, even if, you, even if he chooses not to save us, we're still going to believe in him. And the most amazing thing happens. They get thrown into that fire that has been heated up seven times, and they don't come out, not even smelling of fire. Our God changes facts. Fire burns. God heals. <coughs> so where to from here? I'd like to put some thoughts before you, something to ponder in your small groups. 
Suffering humbles us. Pain humbles us. It reminds us that we are not in control, that we are finite. The problem is that we can become so self-absorbed in pain that we forget everything else. And we actually find our identity in suffering or in pain or in sickness. And that's never what God intended us to be. Uh, suffering is a place where God can get our full attention. It's that place where he can continue the work of transforming us into the very image of Jesus. This is something that I found very interesting. David, King David said this, My troubles turned out all for the best. They forced me to learn from your textbook. If you're going through any kind of suffering at the moment, where are you looking for an answer? Here it is in God's word. If you're facing suffering, God has got your attention. Listen to him. Suffering should be a community building experience. I said to you just now that when the toe gets hurt, the whole body bends over. And it's a, a thing that happens. I don't say, my toe doesn't say, hey, I've got pain, I've got pain. And hand says, I don't care. But the whole body bends. And so when any one of us is suffering, the whole body becomes involved in that. <coughs> it's learning in our situation to be vulnerable. How often do we say to one another, how are you? I'm fine, fine. You're a liar. You're suffering, but you will not share because I am stoic. And you know what you're doing? You're denying the body, the rest of us, the ability to reach out and say, may we pray with you? How can we help you? It's a body. This pain is a, it's a community building exercise. It actually draws us closer to one another. And so we express this every time we break communion. Next time we break communion and we have these words, we who are many are one loaf because we all participate with the one loaf or we are one body. Because we all participate in the one loaf. We're all part of Jesus. Finally, suffering is something that God uses to train us in righteousness. Oops, this is painful. One of the most difficult things for us to experience or to receive is that God, a God of love, would use discipline and use a discipline of suffering to get my ears open. Because God is our loving Father, He will discipline us as children. If He doesn't, then you're an illegitimate child. If you're not disciplining child children, you are raising illegitimate children. So it is foreign to the ears of many people because we reject ultimately the final authority and we sometimes refuse to be the final authority in our families. And the result is suffering and pain. And when we take God as our example and we, we exercise the righteousness of God in our lives, we will find happy wife, happy family, happy South Africa. We need to identify first and foremost as children of God. We need to allow Jesus to be shining through us. <laughs> I'd like to close by referring you to a quote from Peter. Make this the reason for our living as Christians. The suffering won't last forever. Take comfort. It won't be long before this generous God who has great plans for us in Christ eternal and glorious plans they are, will have you put together and on your feet for good. He gets the last word. Yes, he does. Let's, let's pray. If you can just bow your heads in prayer. I, I have a sense that there are there are some people here who are experiencing pain. And the pain can be 
broken relationships, either with your, your immediate family or broken relationships with your child and your suffering, broken relationship with your parent and your suffering. I have a sense that there are some people who have, who have crawled away in their suffering into isolationism and you've not allowed anyone in and you're suffering. You wonder why nobody cares, nobody can see. But you've crawled away into isolationism. And Jesus wants to tell you, you're a part of a body. You belong here. We love you. I think some of you might have been suffering simply because you believe in Jesus at work in your family people are ostracizing you because of your faith in Jesus and you're wondering is it worth is it worth it yes it is there will be people on duty in front here if you need prayer for those things I've mentioned, but if anything else, any other need you have, there will be people who are ready to pray with you. If you're a first-time visitor, please meet some of us at the back of the church. Um, we're ready there to meet with you and, and share with you. If you, before you run away, just enjoy the body relationship right here by having some tea and coffee with us and there's even a scone on a scone don't run away allow God to build up our sense of community so may the Lord bless you and keep you may the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you may the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace in Jesus name Amen.